Good afternoon. Oh. oh, I'm on. There we go. Good to be with all of you. I'm Pastor Olson from St. Paul, Mo uh, Montpelier, Luxembourg, however you want to define it. Uh, suburban Luxembourg, not inner city. Uh, the, good to be with all of you this afternoon. I guess you guys, I won't bother to tell you to spring ahead because you don't have to worry about that tomorrow morning, right? If you miss it, it's okay. Uh, you'll figure it out by next week. The uh, opening uh, song is in uh, the folders in the order of services settings three this afternoon. We will begin with the opening song. Blessings on your worship this afternoon. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 17. All the congregations of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 9, which we will speak responsively half verse by half verse. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is a great God. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. O come, let us worship and bow down. For he is our God. Today, if you hear his voice, when your fathers put me to the test, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the fourth chapter.
The gospel reading is also the text for this, for this afternoon's sermon. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jo Joseph's, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, worried as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the sermon hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is our gospel reading, particularly the words of verses 13 and 14. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So far our text. Please be seated. Do you drink any of the so-called energy drinks? There are about a hundred different ones, right? There's Red Bull, there's Amp, Four Hour Energy, and then a bunch of them that I don't even know. I was thinking about this yesterday when my wife made me go to the grocery store for something. And as I was standing there in the checkout aisle, there must be just there alone at least a dozen different ones. If you don't drink them, I can tell you that somebody else is. Because an industry that didn't even exist just not too many years ago has now become a hundred billion dollar a year industry. And by the end of the decade, it is anticipated that it will surpass $250 billion a year. Whether you like that stuff or not, it is very clear that they have struck a nerve, right? It is very clear that this is an industry for which there is incredible demand. Now, for the sake of full disclosure, I will tell you that I do not drink the stuff. Never have, doubt that I ever will. The reason for that is because I have read the ingredients on the label. That stuff does not look like it could possibly taste good. In fact, the ones, some of them that I saw yesterday, they were putting in things like Skittles and so forth to try to mask the taste, right? I look at the ingredients and the only thing that I can imagine that could probably taste worse as far as drinks go would be V8. The idea is that vegetables taste so good Let's put them in a liquefied form and in a can and drink them. No, thank you. But I do know, and some of it's a generational thing, I will say, because I have seen teenage kids that will take two 16-ounce cans of that stuff and down it in a matter of minutes. Why? I don't think it's the taste, do you? I think that there is something more going on than just physical thirst, right? I think that when people drink that stuff, what they're wanting is what that stuff promises, right? And that stuff promises that it will do a lot more than satisfy your physical thirst. That stuff promises that it will give you the ability to not need any sleep whatsoever, right? It will give you the ability to run from here to Green Bay and back in 20 minutes without a car. It will give you the ability to fly. And I have to tell you, having seen kids who drink this stuff by the gallon, if the goal is hyperactivity, this stuff works. But we are a thirsty people, aren't we? When you visit someone's home, what's the first thing that they offer to you? They ask you if you need a drink. When I come here, mercifully, they, I didn't notice till now that there's a little pink pig on the uh, water bottle, but they give me a bottle of water, right? We don't appreciate it quite as much as they do in hotter climates, but we know that people are thirsty, don't we? We understand the need to have your thirst quenched. Have you ever had somebody say, I need a drink? Maybe you've said that, right? When you said that, what were you saying? Were you saying that you were just really physically thirsty? Maybe you were, but I doubt it. When people say that I need a drink, usually they are expressing something that goes deeper than physical thirst, aren't they? Usually when people say that, they are expressing that there is a deeper thirst, right? 
Sometimes when people say that, what they mean is that they need to be able to escape the realities of this world. They're saying that they need some kind of a relief. They are expressing that there is something deeper going on than just physical thirst. Jesus talks to a woman in our gospel reading, and she is thirsty, right? She shows up there certainly because she has a physical thirst. That's very obvious. But Jesus immediately takes her to a much deeper thirst, doesn't he? Jesus understands that the issues that she has are much greater than just a physical thirst. Jesus understands that there is a deep longing within her that needs to be satisfied. Now, I don't know if she was drawing up energy drink from that well, but Jesus understands that what she's drawing up from that well is not going to satisfy the thirst that she has in her life. You see, Jesus takes something that is a very basic physical need, and he takes us into something that is much greater into something spiritual. We saw that last week in our gospel reading with Nicodemus. I don't know if the sermon was on, Nic uh, was on that gospel reading last week, but I'm assuming that you heard it. And we see there that Jesus talks to Nicodemus, and he takes him from something basic and physical to something much greater. Jesus talks to him about, about being born again, and what happens? Nicodemus has a lot of difficulty making the transition to that greater thing, doesn't he? And we see it with the woman in our gospel reading here today. She's having a lot of trouble making that transition from that basic physical thirst to the much greater spiritual thing. Jesus tells her that he wants to give her living water What's Jesus talking about there? Well, we know that Jesus is talking about himself. He's talking about the forgiveness of sins that he's come into this world to bring. He's talking about the eternal life, the assurance of heaven itself, the confidence of knowing that we are at peace with God. That's the living water that Jesus has come to offer. And Jesus offers that living water to this woman. But she can't quite get it at first, can she? You see, this woman does not understand that there is a deeper need, does she? She thinks that Jesus is just talking about a better water from a well, right? It's kind of like people who drink those energy drinks. Not to beat up on you if you're in that category. But I always think to myself, people are trying to solve a greater issue with that, aren't they? You see, there's something more going on, and I think to myself, it's never going to work. Maybe instead of guzzling energy drink, people could try something like going to bed before, say, 2 a.m. That might help, huh? Well, you see, this woman, she doesn't understand that there's something greater going on than just physical thirst, and it can't be solved just by drinking more water out of the bucket from that well. There's something much, much deeper. How often do we do that? How often do we become focused on the physical, material things? How often do we end up like that woman, Believing that if we could just have more of the things of this world, that would satisfy our thirst. I remember talking to a man one time years ago, and I remember him talking about how he felt like he could never get ahead. He said that he believed years ago that if he could get to the point where he had $100,000 in the bank, then he would be able to relax. Then he would be satisfied. He got there and found out it didn't work. And he complained that no matter how much he got, he never felt like he could get ahead. Now, maybe you think that if you could get that much in the bank, it would be different for you. It wouldn't be. You see, that's the lie that this woman, that's the thinking that this woman in our gospel reading has. She thinks that if she can just get enough of the things of this world, that's 
going to do it for her. We know that it doesn't work. You see, the problem for the Samaritan woman, and sometimes for us, is that she's drinking from contaminated wells, right? Uh, we know how dangerous that is to drink from a contaminated well with physical water, right? We hear about that, certainly enough. But Jesus is pointing out to her that she is drinking from a well that is contaminated spiritually. She's drinking from a well that she thinks if she can just get enough of the stuff of this world, that's going to bring peace, happiness, satisfaction, and all of the other things that she so desperately needs in her life. But we know that it doesn't work. And Jesus immediately confronts her. And it's an amazing, it's an interesting transition that Jesus makes, isn't it? He tells her to go get her husband. And what does she say? She says, I don't have one. Now you see, she's not lying there, right? She's just not telling the truth. That's what you call a half-truth, which is really the same as a lie, isn't it? How often do we only tell half-truths? It's kind of like the kid when his dad asks him, did you break that window? The kid who saw his brother break the window. His dad asks him, did you break that window? And what does the kid say? With a very straight face and with as, honest, with as much honesty as he can muster, he says, no, I did not break that window. Well, that's a half-truth, isn't it? And that stuff works with us a lot, doesn't it? It's pretty easy for us to get taken in. You see, contrary to what they claim, it really isn't that easy to tell if people are lying. At least not some people. Some people are so good at lying, so skilled at it. you got to ask pretty specific questions. But you see, Jesus, you can't lie to him. You can't lie to God. He knows. Jesus knows that she's had five husbands. And he knows that the person that she is with right now, that she's not even married to. You see, what Jesus is doing here is exposing this woman's sin. And why is he doing that? Why is Jesus so intent on exposing this woman's sin? You see, I suppose in our world, we might have a different view on it, right? What Jesus was doing was exposing what she had done wrong. What would we say about that? I suppose in our world, we might say somebody that had been married five times and was now living with someone that she wasn't married to, I suppose we might say, well, she was just doing what made her happy, even though it obviously isn't making her happy. We would say that she was just pursuing what she wanted to do, but not Jesus. You see, Jesus exposes her sin because Jesus understands that this is the source of her thirst. What is it that is ultimately causing her to have this thirst in her life? It is her sin. And Jesus understands that the only way that her thirst can be satisfied is when she understands what it is that is truly causing it. Jesus does the same as well to us. We understand the source of our thirst in this world, don't we? We understand that it is our thirst that makes us long for something, that it is our sin that makes us long for something more. You see, Jesus points out our sin to us during this Lenten season so that we realize what it is that we need in order for that thirst to be satisfied. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he cried out, I thirst. You see what Jesus was doing there? He was taking our sin, all of the things that we do wrong, he was taking all of the things that cause us to long for more. He was taking all of the times when we pursue after the things of this world to solve our thirst, to quench our thirst. He was taking that into himself and paying for it that we might have the forgiveness of our sins, that we might have the assurance that he has quenched our thirst. When the woman at the well heard about this living water, 
when she heard that she could have the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life, that she could be at peace with God, she was excited. Who wouldn't be? And she asked Jesus, she says, tell me, where can I get this living water? Well, we want to know that too, don't we? And we do know. Jesus comes to you again here in his word. And he gives you that assurance of forgiveness. He gives you that living water. He comes to you in bread and wine. And he quenches your thirst. He gives you forgiveness. He gives you the assurance of life everlasting in the assurance of his presence with you. You see, Jesus gives you today, here today, he gives you that true energy, that true energy drink that truly quenches your thirst. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, you have brought us to dwell in your house and called us to worship you in spirit and truth. Receive our praise and hear our prayers that we would leave this place satisfied with your living water. Lord of hosts, you led your ancient people by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Lead us through the wilderness of this world by the hand of faithful pastors that we would be refreshed by the living water flowing from the stricken side of Christ. Lord of hosts, you have made us righteous through Jesus Christ and made peace with us by his cross. Lead us to embrace our suffering and faith as they shape us in his image and prepare us to behold your glory in heaven. Lord of hosts, bless the nations of the world that both citizens and authorities would seek justice, peace, and the common good for all. Lord of hosts, Grant us safe haven at your altar, that we who bear the weight of sin, the sin of this world and its sorrows, would always long for your courts and the blessings you have prepared for those who sing your praise. Lord God, Heavenly Father, to you all hearts are open and all sins are known. Strengthen our hearts by your grace, that we who daily sin much would make confession boldly and then joyfully receive your precious word of absolution. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. 
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks unto thee, almighty God, that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we beseech thee that of thy mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.